to bring out uh, a great entrepreneur. Uh, I've, I've uh, known this lady for a couple of years now. Uh, heard her speak at a conference and I was, I was blown away. Um, and uh, invited her to speak at a couple of other conferences. We've, we've uh, spoke together a few times. Um, she's got a company here in, uh, in Utah. Uh, it's not based here, but the vast majority of her employees are here. She loves the state. She loves being involved with this. And, uh, you know, has a great story. So please welcome to the stage, Raswana Bashir. All right, so what do you think of Utah? Um, I love it here. Um, I feel very fortunate to have discovered Utah. Um, we have our main office in San Francisco, but now about three quarters of our team, we have over 100 people here in Utah, and it's been an incredible place to, to have a second office. I love spending time here. The talent is amazing. Um, you guys have basically fostered an incredible tech community here, the CEOs, and everyone's been so friendly and welcoming, and I think that's very special. Um, and I can see an incredible amount of innovation that's going to come out of the state. So the stereotypical question would be, um, so wait, you're not Mormon and your family's not Mormon? It's not. You didn't go to the U or BYU? I didn't. I'm, you I'm must disappointing own a you. You must own a cabin in Deer Valley then. <laughs> no, I don't even do that yet. So wait, why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> That's the stereotypical, right? But it's not. There's none of those reasons. Tell us why you're here. Why did you build an office here? Well, we bought, built an office um, you know, so with Peak. Um, we are a platform for activities, so we help people book things to do. She's on message. You see that? You guys notice that PR right there? I asked her one question. She's like, hold on a second. I have a message to deliver. Let me tell you about Peak, and then I'll answer your question, Josh. This is what it's like being friends with Roswana. <laughs> Go ahead, please. <laughs> I think they want to hear about yeah, Of course they do. I was going to ask. I was going to get to it. <laughs> but yeah, go ahead. No, no, but for kids, we do activities. Um, actually, Utah is a great center for activities. Um, and so one of the, you know, you mentioned skiing, but there's yeah. all these other incredible things that you can do. There's these huge national parks. So one of the things that we care about is connecting the world through experiences. And for us, Utah was a place which had incredible technology talent combined with this love of the outdoors and activities. And so that was a perfect match. Um, and it's always a little bit scary when you're going to go and start a new office. And I think we came here and we realized that there was incredible talent um, and a lot of passion for being able to build startups. And, you know, we are still relatively early stage. And I think that there's a ton of people here who want to be in an environment that is in fast growth, um, where there's a lot going on and there's a lot to challenge yourself with. Yeah, so how many people do you actually have here in Utah? Then? We have about 100 people in the oh, office. And when did you start getting folks here? Um, just about 18, 18 months ago. We so 18, months, 18 months you've gone from zero to 100 people here in Utah. Have a new office. Yeah. Right? When we, we're adding more. So if you're thinking about a great place to work, we're looking for a great director of HR, a ton of salespeople, lots and lots of functions. So we are adding, um, and it's a great place to work, in my humble opinion. So we have a, we have a massive rule here amongst uh, all the CEOs that we're not going to come and recruit uh, all the other employees that are showing up to... Silicon Slopes, so. Uh, but they can work at peak. You missed the memo on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it seems like great culture, great environment, and um, I got to come and meet your team, and certainly a lot of energy, a lot of fun, you know, awesome startup. How did you come up with the idea? How did that come about in the first place for peak? Um, so I was on a trip to Istanbul, and uh, I really wanted to find some great things to do. And I ended up spending about 20 hours figuring out what I could do and then actually booking it. Um, and unfortunately, I don't speak Turkish, and it was a little hard to communicate with the local tour operators. And so I just I wanted to have this great trip and do get a chance to explore the culture and see amazing things. And yet, it was very, very difficult. And I didn't understand why I couldn't just go online and book the things I wanted to do. Uh, it didn't exist, um, and I decided to start Peak. So essentially, with Peak, we are building this platform for activities where you're, you've got about 15,000 activities where you can easily find things to do, whether it's zip lining or boat tours, or perhaps you want to do a cooking class or take your kids rock climbing. Um, we essentially have a platform for you to do that. And as well as that, we have all the software for small businesses. Because as you can imagine, if you are a business that has a boat tour, you're actually not very sophisticated on technology. Um, and so what we're able to do is actually plug for them like the most incredible software to take online bookings, but also to help them run their business. So the tour operators come and use your platform to manage their activities, and it creates a better consumer experience as well. 
Exactly. And so the average business, when they start using our software, sees about a 30 to 40% increase in revenue. Wow. Um, they save 20% of their time. Um, they have a much better customer experience. So we've collected about 700,000 reviews across our platform, um, which are all verified. They're definite customers. And the average rating is 4.8 stars. Wow. So our merchants are able to provide a much forward better... forward-thinking merchants are the ones using the platform, and then they're improving their experiences as well. Exactly, exactly. So they're seeing all these benefits um, of technology. Um, and so now you can... You, maybe you're on the beach, you walk up, and they'll be able to have our iPad app up help you pay and go on your tour. So it's really revolutionized this traditionally offline industry and brought it online. Um, and so that's actually been very empowering as well to have thousands of small businesses using us and seeing this massive impact. Because as you can imagine, if you're a small business, maybe you've been doing hot air balloon rides for 50 years, it's been sure. in the family. But the whole move to online and the fact that consumers are pulling out their mobile phones and trying to book experiences in two or three hours, so do the, you don't know about that. Are the operators the ones that drive most of the bookings? It's a mix. Because they had their own historical marketing and channels, right? So we work on both sides. So we've, we're now doing hundreds of millions of dollars of bookings for our platform. Uh, and some of that's coming from our operators and some of it's actually coming from peak.com. Um, so we actually have a site where people can book and we actually have partnerships as well. So if you go onto Yelp, um, you can book now using Peak, and it's actually a co-branded partnership. Oh, cool. We do the same with Google Search and Google Maps. So How many Google, of those exist? How many of those like, type of partnerships exist with we've Yelp? We've got a handful, but they're like Yelp, Google, Groupon. So they're I pretty mean, large ones. I mean, at Yelp, how many partners are oh, there? Like they, have, they have a few, but we're the main one for activities. That's really cool. Yeah. That's awesome. And the same for Google. So when you had the idea, I think one of the things that's interesting is just kind of hear the story of how these companies get going. Co-founders, were you technical? How did you figure out how to get things built? What did you? How did, what was your next move after Turkey? Um, so my background is actually more on the business side, and after Turkey, I actually came to America because I was living in, in London um, and uh, to go to business school. Uh, like any great entrepreneur, I thought that was what I was supposed to do. It turns out you don't really need to, need to go to business school to become an entrepreneur. If anything, it probably puts you back because people have lots of judgments. Um, but I, I came to America to go to Harvard Business yeah, School. Most entrepreneurs loved MBAs. <laughs> That's a lie. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't at first. I felt like they were all judging me. And then when I got a little bit more sophisticated, then I was like, okay, I can handle the MBAs now. But uh, um, yeah, once you get going, then there's extremely help. It's helpful. kind of a bad word in Silicon Valley, so I try and avoid mentioning this, but since you insist. Um, so we, you know, I came to America to go to business school, and I fell in love with tech startups. Um, and so I uh, worked at a couple of technology companies uh, in New York and really got excited about the impact you could have. And so I'm, I had had this idea for a little while, and I decided to move to Silicon Valley and start working on it. And you know, for me, the big things were, is this a really big market that can have a lot of impact? And it is. It's a $150 billion market. Um, most of which is still offline. So whereas hotels came online in the 80s or 90s, this one is still off. And so there's a big opportunity there. And then something I'm personally really passionate about is that, you know, I live to travel and, and, and connect and go to pl great places and see amazing things, whether that's nature or getting to know a new culture. And so for me, it solved a personal yeah, problem. Yeah, follow, follow us one on Instagram and, and you'll feel like you're watching a travel show, right? <laughs> yeah. I think you told me once, Instagram's not real life. Yeah, it isn't, it isn't, it's just, yeah, I mean. Because you don't work, right? You just travel. Exactly. One of the dangers <laughs> is that, um, you know, I'm pretty intense about work, but uh, I, I, you know, the reason I do that and uh, I'll work till four in the morning is because I want to take those two or three day trips to go and see something incredible. So for me, work-life balance isn't really like that. It's just about intensely living both. And yeah. if you can, going off and doing some adventures. So you got your co-founders and then You've got some incredible, incredible investors as well, like names that we'd all love to aspire to know and interact with. You've got money from them. Eric Schmidt, Jack Dorsey, et cetera. Tell us about how those kind of things came about. Yeah, so we've raised about $40 million to date, um, and that's come from a great group of investors. And so part of that was us, actually, me and my co-founder had spent time in the Valley before, you know, working on some other startups. And so we were able to get some introductions to those investors, and they'd actually invested in, in our companies before, the ones that we were working at. Um, my co-founder's background is he's originally German. Um, he has two degrees from MIT in engineering, spent 15 years building enterprise software in the Valley at the best companies there. And so it was really helpful for us to have this kind of complementary skill set yeah. as we went in. And, um, and over time, 
one of the things we recognize is that people who understand travel or this kind of big local opportunity space started backing us. So the founder of Kayak, uh, the CEO of Travelocity, uh, people who have been early backers of big travel companies saw what we were doing, as well as people who had seen big marketplaces um, or local businesses. So, okay. you know, Eric Schmidt, Jack Dorsey, and these groups were able to come on board and really, were really excited about what we're doing. But a lot of it was around having some credibility built in. Um, we, and once you get the early investors, it is, you know, all of a sudden it gets the momentum going and other people are excited about what you're doing. So what's your previous to starting the company? What, what was your journey like that led you into thinking, I can, I can start a tech company or I want to start a tech company? Um, so, you know, I have a bit more of an unusual path. I, I think when I was growing up, I never thought that I was going to be an entrepreneur. Um, so I grew up in a, um, a small town in the north of England. I think you guys have probably gauged that I'm from England by now. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, um, my parents had immigrated from Pakistan to, to the UK. Um, so it was actually quite a poor community and everyone around me was also Pakistani. And there wasn't a lot of opportunity, to be honest. Um, you know, the, there weren't a lot of people who had, uh, you know, kind of, you know, uh, jobs in, in that were beyond kind of working in factories or being a taxi driver. My dad sold fruit and vegetables on a market store. And so that was kind of the, the opportunity layer. And actually, you know, the women didn't work. The women didn't get educated. And so it was an environment where all the women that I looked at... Women looked didn't get at, educated? No. And it was... It was it in the was, north of London? No, north of England. North of England. Oh, north. Um, and so they were, they, you know, in these very poor communities where, you know, it's very patriarchal. That, unfortunately, was one of the things. So my mum has lived in England for 40 years. She still doesn't speak English. Hmm. And so this was an environment that was very minimizing as a, as, a, as a young girl. There wasn't a lot of opportunity. But it also had a lot of passion and drive. And I, I kind of realized it wasn't a great place to be. Yeah. And so I ended up doing really well at school um, and uh, ended up getting a scholarship to go to Oxford. And that changed my life. I bet. Um, and so you suddenly come as this poor kid from the north to Oxford. And it's what made you want to apply to Oxford? Was that something your parents were pushing you to do? How did how Not at all. They didn't even know about it, right? So it was, um, you know, I think I went to a school where some of the teachers, uh, one of the teachers had gone to Cambridge. And okay. so um, I think they saw in me some capabilities. And so they, they kind of helped me um, think through that. And um, I, I was really intellectually curious. I just loved learning. I was that kid that did way more than you needed to do. Um, and it's really, that worked off. really hard to tell that that's what you were <laughs> like, but... <laughs> yeah, I was extremely, whenever, whenever there was a need to do like one page, I would always do 10. Um, I was like overly earnest. So the, you've talked about, um, you know, before I've heard you speak, you've talked a lot about women in tech and uh, female CEOs and minority CEOs. You check a lot of those boxes. Um, but obviously it's capability that brought you here. But what's that like? What's that experience like? And you know, how can you, can you share some perspective with us? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, look, I th if there aren't that many women in the audience, I imagine here. Um, I, I'm actually very excited about trying to help there be more women. But, uh, you know, I think um, I've always felt a little bit like an outsider, even going to Oxford. I knew that I was very different to everyone else and didn't really fit in. Um, and I think, you know, if you're comfortable with that, it's a lot easier. Yeah. Um, when I, the first job I really had was at Blackstone in private equity, and I was the first woman to be hired into my team. Um, the team had been going for about 20 years, and there were 90 people in the team. Wow. So I was kind of used to being in an environment where there, there weren't that many people that looked like me. Um, and I think my approach to that in the early days was just to try and and, you know, fit in. Um, I think over time, it's, it's good to recognize that you're different and then that has value. Right. Um, I have different perspective. Um, you know, I kind of feel like I've had two worlds where I've come from an environment where I understand two very different cultures like Pakistan and the UK um, and now the US, um, as well as having, you know, a little bit more empathy because actually the journey wasn't easy. Um, it hasn't been hard. I've had to work very hard to get here, but I also realized how lucky I was, you know, to have those breaks. Um, so I think it gives you a very different perspective I think the thing that I've recognized is that then you need to give back because I've been fortunate to get this kind of lottery ticket. Um, it's really important that I give other people those opportunities. And so when it comes to women in tech, I realized that in the Utah, you know, our, our office doesn't have as many women or as many people from other um, groups that I would like. And so we did this women in tech event a couple of nights ago, and I'm working with Clint to kick off a women in tech initiative with Silicon Slopes. And you guys were kind enough to give us some money, so we've raised about $60,000 so far. And I think there's lots of things we can do to empower people who aren't perhaps, don't feel as welcome to be become part of this community. Yeah, and it's, uh, I know there's another, we have women in tech uh, council here in Utah that's got going. And yes. 
hopefully we'll get everyone to, to work together, right? Uh, but uh, it's, it's been fun to see. I mean, tell us about that first event that you guys had and who came and what that experience was like. It was great. I mean, um, it was, we, we had a Margot who's from Ancestry, the CEO, um, and uh, Corinne Clark was speaking, and so some amazing CEOs. We were able to share some of our tips that were specific to this. So I think ultimately, you know, in the end for all of our companies, the more diverse perspectives we have, the better, um, because it makes you better, right? You've got people who aren't just thinking the same way. And actually, we have that culture all across our across the board, not just in Utah, but in terms of the different functions. You know, my co-founder went to MIT, but it's not that every single engineer in our team went to MIT, because that's actually normally what happens is that people pick people who look just like them, who have the same background. That doesn't help you build a startup, because startups actually require that you're willing to really solve very creative and, and difficult problems. Right. And the more people that you have that might take a different perspective, the better off you are. You can all learn from each other. And so one thing that we've kind of relied upon is that our values are all the same. Um, and I think we have a very concrete set of values. But you know, in all the other ways that you might look at us, the way that we look, the way we talk, where we went to school, they are actually very, very different. And right. I'm very grateful for that. And it means that our culture is one where people can really um, you know, feel welcome. It doesn't matter who you are, what you look like, you're always going to have a great time working with us. And it also, I think, gets rid of hierarchy as well. Um, when you have this kind of diverse community where everybody's talking to each other and respecting each other's p opinions. It makes a big difference. Yeah, it was interesting. Yesterday, I was talking to the head of the NAACP, and uh, we were having a conversation about obviously trying to get more diversity in Utah and how we can recruit more people from the outside in. Because you know, if we're just going and finding the little bit of diversity that we have in Utah, given the history of how Utah kind of evolved, there's not as much diversity. And uh, so, if you're just recruiting from the other companies that have diversity, and still not really helping the problem um, in terms of you know just being more inclusive, getting more perspective. And uh, it was interesting what uh, he said to me. He said, you know, one of the challenges when you're trying to recruit people in, they need to see other people like them. He's like, because one of the most important questions is going to be, where do I get my hair cut? You know, and like, you need that kind of central center of gravity so that it's not, you don't want to be the only person. And so I thought that was really, a really interesting point. We've been so lucky as a result of that. We've had some really phenomenal team members join us because they have seen, um, you know, a woman of color as a CEO at the top. And so if you are a woman, you feel potentially more comfortable. And I think if you want that kind of leadership, we've actually got better talent because of it. Um, a good example of that is our VP of product is, um, you know, she's a Stanford engineer. She worked at Goldman Sachs for 10 years. She was one of the first three people um, who was uh, leading product at Uber. Uh, you guys might have heard of that company, did rather well. And so, um, you know, she um, decided she only wanted to work for a female CEO. Um, having seen the environment in some of those other companies, she recognized that she wanted to be a leader in an organization that was going to see things differently. And so we were able to get someone who everybody wanted to hire, and she's been an incredible part of our team. That's so awesome. I think we've been very fortunate because, in some ways, there are things that are disadvantaging. So to your point, you know, sometimes being the only person in the room means that it's harder to raise venture capital. Yeah. So only about 2% of venture capital goes to female CEOs. Um, so that makes it a little tough because there aren't those role models. Um, and, and it can be hard to go into those rooms and not be treated the same. Um, but then the upside is that you do get some advantages as well. And so I think we hope to be able to level those aspects. So the disadvantages, um, you know, combine with these advantages that you're getting. I think the hustle that you bring probably compensates for any disadvantages in your particular case. Uh, it was funny, we were, I was, it was on Wednesday night um, where Swana came in and some other people were coming in, we were talking to different speakers and then a few of us had to go have a meeting uh, about some Silicon Slope stuff and, and uh, she's like, well, where are you going? I'm like, well, there's a few of us, we, we're having like a, a, a little mini board meeting. She's like, I don't care, I'm coming, I need to eat. Okay, there it is. <laughs> and uh, when Frederick spoke yesterday, I don't know if you heard him speak, but uh, I know you met him. Um, and Frederick rolled in like at 11 o'clock. We kept the restaurant open for like 45 minutes. He's got a steak waiting for him. And he comes in and eats this. He said it was the best lukewarm steak that he ever had. And uh, he's talking to him. He's never really interacted with Roswana. They knew each other a little bit. And he's like, yeah. And I, and I said, so what's going on with your podcast? And that's where the quote came from. Roswana was like, yeah, like that's the last thing the world needs is another podcast. <laughs> and we're like, don't. Um, but uh, This is so, going to be a good one, though, so you should. Yeah, it. exactly. So has it been a disadvantage at all? In what way, or I guess it has been. In what ways is it a disadvantage? Or how? It's just, 
it's just different, right? At the end of the day, startups are hard. Getting people to believe in you is hard, right. um, and I think it's different. And I think, so like someone said, like you're always selling everything that you do as a founder and entrepreneur. Yeah, and I think maybe you know people come with a few more assumptions. But I'm sure, like one of the things I've seen, and I think I've connected so well with the s CEOs here in Utah, because you guys have the same thing, right? You're going to Silicon Valley and saying, hey, we've got these great products, and people are kind of like, who are you? Where are you from? We don't yeah. know about this, yeah. right? So when you guys were doing it, it's similar. And so I think in some ways, when we're all the underdogs, it makes you work harder, it makes you fight harder. And it makes me more grateful, right? And so I take, I take so much privilege in like having this opportunity to build a company. I care so much about having a great culture and helping inspire all these other people to become future entrepreneurs and leaders. And so I think it, it really makes you realize how fortunate we all are. And I, I love my job and everything that we're doing. So what is that culture like? What's your culture like at Peak? How do you describe so, it? I'd say that it's people who are really driven. It's often people who like want to uh, be the best that they can be each day. They want to be challenged. Um, you know, I think some people have kind of said after one year, like, wow, I learned more in this last year than I did in 10 years. So it's a very fast, you know, like we said, we've doubled the business um, in the last year and we'll probably triple the business this year. And so as you can imagine, when you're talking in volumes that involve hundreds of millions of dollars of bookings, right. that's kind of tough. And so it's got to be people who are willing to take on that challenge and want to make themselves better. Um, and also I think it's quite fun, right? At the end of the day, we help people book activities. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do activities um, and experiences. And I think the last thing is I think there's a lot of humility. There's a ton of really smart people, but no one is too good to talk to anyone else. There's the, you know, we want questions. We want everyone to push. Every single person has a voice. And I think that's very important. I think it's something that certainly in my career, in my, um, I didn't see that. Being in organizations which were very hierarchical wasn't for me. I much prefer being in a place where you know, my, my team will say, you're the first time that a CEO is meeting with me. Um, and, and so I think that's really, really healthy is to have an environment where we all learn from each other. So I know that uh, we're both in the same boat on this next uh, item. Uh, some of you were expecting Ben Silverman this morning from Pinterest. I was expecting Ben Silverman this morning from Pinterest. He was going to speak at peak as well. And uh, <laughs> you, you, he was going to speak for you guys as well. But uh, yesterday afternoon, ben, um, ben unfortunately had to cancel last minute. And obviously, he, he knew there were 20,000 people waiting for him. So. Uh, it was something that was that was uh, you know something he really needed to take care of. So uh, we'll, we'll forgive him as long as he comes back. Um, and uh, they're trying to make it work for next year. But sorry, we don't have Pinterest. But uh, it was an easy audible to call yesterday afternoon when we found that out. I was like, cool. We'll slot Roswana off of the the side stage and bring her main stage. Um, you're one of the most fascinating people that I get to enjoy working with and talking to. Um, one of the sharpest people I've ever interacted with. And it's really fun to see how you interact with your team. And when I got to go to your office and speak to your folks and see how much everyone's behind you and, you know, really wants to help you be successful. And I think that's a great sign of a leader when you have people that they want to be in that boat with you. They want to follow you down that river. They want to follow you up that mountain. And I guess, you know, the last question is, in terms of peak and how you set that thing up, what's, what's next? How, how do you see peak looking, you know, next year, five years down the road? What's the long-term vision for that company? Yeah, so today we help you book 15,000 activities, mainly in the US and Mexico. Um, that's going to change. We're going to continue. So we're con actually, the funny thing in America is that about 80% of tour operators still don't have online booking. So we've still got loads of space to continue to work in the US. So we're going to be getting everybody on board. Um, and then we're hopefully going to be doing that on a global level. At the end of the day, when it comes to this space, um, experiences, people don't really have a good place to go. And yet, that's what makes you happy. When you think about what gives you joy, it's not buying products. It's about spending really quality time, learning something new, uh, being in a new place, and frankly, being with your friends and family and, and having that connection. And I think in the age that we're in, having opportunities to have more connection really matters. And so I think what we're going to be able to do is really you know, connect these experiences to the world and then connect the world through experiences and hopefully have an environment where we appreciate other cultures more because right. we're going off and seeing them. And I think it's actually quite important to, to have these more local and authentic experiences as well. And so when I look to the future about Peak, I think we've got a huge opportunity to have this impact to give people lots more joy, a lot more smiles. 
mean that you do a better date night and you have more fun with your kids at the weekends um, so that they're learning and adventuring. Uh, and hopefully we will be able to become the company that, you know, there's so many companies you associate with these other places, yeah. whether it's Pinterest for, for everything right. to do with a kind of uh, a home decor or all this other stuff. And it should be for peak for activities and experiences. And a lot of people do local activities. So about 35% of our bookings are happening in people's local hometowns. So I'm excited that we're going to change the way people spend their time um, to, to one where perhaps it's not as engaging and fun into something that's actually people together, having fun together, uh, and, and having those memories forever. Well, we certainly wish you the best of luck. There's another uh, example of one of the many companies that's, that's up and coming here in the state, and certainly wish luck to all of you, and uh, we'll definitely claim Raswana as one of our own here in Utah, and, and let's keep building Silk and Slopes together. So congratulations, and let's give a round of applause for Raswana. Thank you very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause for Raswana and Josh. Josh, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen.